Funding provided by Connecticut Green Bank. From the ocean to the forest, from the Arctic to Connecticut shores, climate change has gripped our planet. Each year, hurricanes and wildfires topple homes, knock out power, and cause billions of dollars of damage. Air pollution has gripped many northeastern cities, and melting ice and rising seas have drastically altered coastal communities. And throughout all of this change, there have been eyewitnesses, people with first-hand insight into how the climate is changing and what it means for all of us. For Connecticut Public, I'm Patrick Scahill. This is Cutline. This hour, we'll ask eyewitnesses to climate change to describe what they have seen. From the secrets buried in ancient ice cores to observations logged in the journals of Henry David Thoreau, we'll explore how scientists, government officials, and medical professionals have all watched as the world changed. We begin with one scientist who has spent more than four decades studying birds and watching as the ice melts. I wonder sometime after 45 years on the island why I'm here and how I got here. And I have to look back to the summer of 1972 when I was doing a census of all the barrier islands off northern Alaska and happened to visit Cooper Island. And you have to be careful who and what you fall in love with in your 20s because um, I found a small colony of black guillemots here and came back to study that colony. And then once it got some momentum, uh, it just kept going. All of a sudden, it became clear that my findings on the one island uh, tie in very much with what's happening with global warming. And you thought, oh, this is a little trend, but you never expect the trend to go the way it has gone. Because you think, wait a minute, if that keeps going, that's going to mean that it's going to get too warm to have ice and snow up here, which means that the Arctic is no longer the Arctic, which is still, for me, uh, almost incomprehensible. Having been out here for the bulk of my life, what I knew every summer is that I would be coming back to this island to study the biology of the species and also experience the Arctic and have that be my life for three months um, and not be on the grid, not be driving a car, um, and unfortunately not even taking a shower. This is a place that is a constant in my life and gives me some stability. But uh, from the first days of the study, um, the isolation that I experienced and that is necessary for being uh, on Cooper Island and gathering the data on the Black Guillemots is something that had its costs. Many of my friends have gotten married and I have missed all the weddings. And I realized uh, recently that I've missed many of my weddings because the, the people that I had intended to marry went on with the wedding and luckily found someone who could stand in for me uh, to, be, to, be, to be the groom so that, so that I didn't get married during what should have been my wedding. Much of the time over the past 44 years, I have, and it's gotten to be more common recently, I wake up and I look around and go, wait a minute, it's 2019. In the 70s and throughout the 80s, I could come out here by snow machine over sea ice up until almost mid-June. Now one can't do that because the ice is breaking up starting as early as late May. And like any long-term relationship, you don't really appreciate something until it's gone. Suddenly, a place that used to be mainly white and then always had the ice just offshore, it's like blue water to the horizon. There's been this major decline 
The ice that used to be close to shore is now hundreds of miles offshore. I see these birds that I've known for so long struggling to deal with the fact that they have a very different universe than they had in the 70s and 80s and early 90s when, when I was first out here. Black guillemots, the species of seabird I'm studying, this is a species that's adapted to the high Arctic. It isn't migratory. Guillemots have the problem of having predators that will take their eggs in chicks, so they have to breed in cavities. And the fact that I landed on an island that had no natural cavities, and I found 17 nests that first year, I thought, well, this is pretty amazing, because they really just have used wooden boxes that the, that the Navy happened to drop off there in the 1950s. And I thought, well, this is excellent. I could just put up more boxes and have a nice colony I can study in a way that I couldn't study most other seabirds. For the first few decades, um, I was just the, the somewhat strange person on the island studying this population of birds. And I am following their mating and breeding habits uh, every year. I'm out here alone for much of the summer, and I'm experiencing all the data on a day-to-day -day basis at a level that is very different than most climate change scientists. This is heightened by the fact that birds that I have banded as chicks have come back to breed here for up to 33 years. So I've had this connection with the colony that was so uh, exciting to find. It was the first record of black guillemots breeding in the area that I thought, well, this is really something. And it's also something that no one else was doing. I go out and walk through the colony and I go through these nest checks, going up to the site, seeing that it's okay, and peeking in to see who's back at each nest site. I look at the color bands on the birds and write that down. If there are eggs in the nest, if there's a parent bird attending them, if they've been incubated for a while to see if those eggs have hatched. Um, and then once the chicks are hatched in August, when I visit a nest, I take the chicks out of the nest and weigh them uh, and measure them so I can look at their growth rates. My data showed the fact that the spring was getting warmer and birds were laying their eggs earlier and many of the chicks uh, are dying and, and they're certainly growing at a slower rate. So however widespread guillemots used to be, whereas in the past 10% of the chicks might die in the nest, now up to 60% of them would die. I mean, over the past two decades, as it's become clear that I am studying the canary in the coal mine, I think about what canaries in the coal mine were meant to do. They were meant to be a warning. Once you see that the canary is under stress or close to dying, you, you realize we might be under stress. So it's meant to be an indicator that humans need to do something. One could expect now, based on what we're seeing on Cooper, this is now an important data set for something that's happening globally. I didn't want to study climate change. Climate change found this study and found me and said, okay, you are no longer doing the standard bird study. You're now studying the fact that the Arctic is melting. I met George Devoki 18 years ago, in 2001. I was assigned by a major magazine to take a look at George and his bird studies. One of the main reasons I came back up to Cooper was to recreate a photograph I did with George back in 2001. In that photograph, he's standing on solid ice framed by the Arctic sky. George has told me that if he went back to that exact same spot and stood there for a photograph, he would be up to his waist in water. Anybody home? Cheryl. Dude, what are you doing, man? 18 years. 18 years. 18 years. I knew you'd come back. <laughs> you said you'd come back. I did say it, and I, I meant it. It took a while. It took a while, but... Yeah. You but made some improvements. Yeah, the yeah. cabin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, why don't you come inside and take a load off? All right, thanks, man.
You know, as a photographer, you shoot thousands and thousands of pictures. Only a few stick to you, you know, really. That photograph that we made on the ice all those years ago has been one of those photographs. When I first saw it, uh, I was just blown away. It captured so much. It just brings me a great deal of pleasure, and your work has played a major part in this. It is nice that I'm noticed as someone who's doing work that's important. Uh, it makes all the, all the difference to me. Yeah, and what we're gonna do is recreate that one photograph. What are we up against? Well, you and I were walking down the North Beach and there was this great light to the north and you said, hey, could you stand out there on the ice a little bit? I'll get a picture of you. And neither of us had any idea no. what that would mean in no. terms of that image and things like that. Now, the North Beach uh, has water from the beach out to probably 400 miles. So having me be where I was standing, but that spot is now, it's open ocean. And, and again, to have that major change, and even back then, if you look at the models of how sea ice was gonna disappear, nobody predicted this rate of loss. The speed of it is astonishing. Yeah, the speed. People were saying, by the end of the century, sea ice may be gone. And now they're saying, maybe in six years, it'll be gone. Do you ever think about, if you were not on the island, how small the colony might oh, be? Oh, I know. Well, no, see, that's it. Like, if I hadn't yeah, pursued it, it would have been, you know, I mean, it would have it would have been maybe 25 pairs. And when the polar bears showed up, it would have been wiped out. It's just remarkable, I mean, because you've, you've helped these birds adapt. Yes. George is a remarkable individual, incredibly tenacious. What he's chosen to do in the face of this gloom and doom that we hear about all the time in terms of global warming, is he's chosen to focus on the specific elements that are in front of him, to educate all of us and give us hope for the future that we could turn this thing around. This exact spot used to be ice 18 years ago. This isn't a computer module or an algorithm or a prediction. This is real life. George has seen it and experienced it. He's worthy of a photograph, and I'm proud to take it. <laughs> so, what do you think? That's it. That's the picture. You got it. I am hoping that my legacy will be that I gathered this data set that uh, certainly helped some people see that climate change was happening and that there was a study that was started in 1975 of a thriving seabird colony in Arctic Alaska and the colony is now facing extinction and that happened in one researcher's lifetime. Because the longest uh, study of an Arctic seabird, <clears throat> the longest continuous study of an Arctic seabird uh, is a very important resource. And um, it's being seen that way by more and more people. And uh, it's, it, it is just too valuable for it to end, uh, no matter what might happen to me. Um, if, it, if it continues to monitor something as important as climate change, I have hoped that many species and most importantly, humans will get to the point where they'll go, you know, we need to be able to change what we're doing because of these changes in our environment. All right, be well, man. Okay, be well. well. All right. I'm going to see you again in five years. In out five here. years, I'm going to hold you to that. The 50th. Yes. All right. For sure. All right, stay okay. safe. Yeah, safe travels. Thanks, man. The two or three times when I almost didn't come back to keep the study going, the reason I did was because of my personal connection to the island, because my experience has made it so much a part of my life. What I really hope, to the extent that I set up any sort of thing that can be maintained in the future, it'll be like, yes, somebody needs to go back to Cooper Island every summer and see who's trying to breed and band any chicks that are fledged from that island so that the study can be maintained.
Joining me now via Skype is George DeVoki, Director for Cooper Island Arctic Research. We're also joined by Mary Albert, Professor of Engineering at Dartmouth and Executive Director of the U.S. Ice Drilling Program, and James Carlton, Professor of Marine Sciences Emeritus at Williams College. George, I'll begin with you as we tape this. You're preparing to head out to Cooper Island in just a few days. Describe for us what you expect to see up there this year and how you left the island last year. Well, this year um, in the Arctic is going to be a very interesting year because as the melt has continued, my population has been on a downward trajectory ever since 1990. And the last year was a year where we only had 25 pairs breeding versus the 225 pairs that we had in the late 80s. So I'm afraid of what I'm going to be seeing. I'm, I'm very uh, concerned about what I'm going to be seeing. But I'm also having that pre-field excitement because I'll be seeing some birds that I've been following for 20 years coming back to breed and seeing how they're coping with a melting Arctic. Do you find that you get that excitement every year? Uh, yes. I do. I do. People say, how can you keep going back there every year? And I say, well, because I really want to. Um, I mean, and which has been, I've been fortunate uh, to have a study that is uh, at a place in the world where what a bird population is doing is of interest to a much larger audience because of the fact that it's, uh, it is an indicator of, of a much bigger problem than just what's happening with one seabird colony. One of the commonalities uh, of many among our panelists today is that you've all uh, traveled a lot uh, doing research. So Mary, I'll turn to you. You visited uh, Greenland, you visited Antarctica, you've spent a lot of time looking at ice. Uh, George was describing some of the things he's expecting to see on Cooper Island when, he's go when he goes back. Um, when you're in these icy regions, what, what are you seeing when you're out there in the field? Well, the cryosphere is is changing a lot now. Typically, when I've been out in the field, it's been in the center of the Greenland ice sheet or the Antarctic ice sheet, where snow rarely melts. Uh, we were in the center of Greenland ice sheet in 2012 when it had um, the most massive lateral extent of melting on the ice sheet that has happened since 1889. And we were, uh, happened to be in the right place at the right time to witness that. In the ice core record, we can see changes that have happened much further into the past, both in Greenland and Antarctica. And uh, when you say cryosphere, Mary, so uh, for the non-scientists like myself, explain uh, what region that's referring to. Cryosphere uh, refers to the two regions that have snow and ice um, for a major part of the year. So it might be alpine glaciers in Alaska or Switzerland. It's also uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic where the world's two massive ice sheets, the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheet are. And so, uh, James, we'll turn to you now. You've traveled the world looking at our oceans, watching how uh, species move, how they adapt to a changing climate. What are you seeing when you're out in the field? I've been um, recently working uh, at field sites uh, in New England, um, in Chile, uh, Galapagos Islands, Pacific Northwest, one of the uniform things that we see all over the world is that there are a great many species moving poleward in, in both hemispheres. And if we use the Atlantic coast as an example, we have something called Caribbean creep, where many species from the Caribbean are colonizing the southwest Atlantic coast. And up here in New England, we have Chesapeake creep, where a lot of species that historically uh, occurred no further north than Chesapeake or Delaware Bay are now showing up in Long Island Sound, some of them turning around the corner. Of Cape Cod and heading up to Gulf of Maine. And so, uh, George, I, I want to throw it back to you because I, I understand you've witnessed some of this creep uh, in, in your research when it comes to the food sources that are out there for the birds that you're studying. Can you talk a little bit about how those food sources have changed for black guillemots? Well, my subspecies of black guillemot is adapted to feeding under the ice on Arctic cod. And Arctic cod are a very high calorie fish that is the that forms the basis for the for the for the food web in the Arctic. Basically, all the seals are eating Arctic cod, and polar bears are just basically repackaged Arctic cod. Um, Arctic cod are found in waters rarely above two degrees Celsius, around what 34 or five degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And as as the ocean has warmed, the Arctic cod have disappeared, so that the prey that my species depends on, and certainly when they're feeding their young, they depend on it, has disappeared. And the alternate prey um, are all substandard in terms of both abundance and quality. So, so uh, that has been one of the major things that has been driving them uh, down in the population. But we are hoping, uh, as was mentioned in terms of the rain shifts, 
that subarctic fish may be coming up into the area. And when they do, then the Gila Mount population would very likely turn to these to these rather high density and um, um, and and actually very high caloric uh, forage fish that that are currently being documented as moving up into the into the Western Arctic. Mary, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the work you've done studying ice cores and how ice cores can preserve a, a very, very large scale record of climate changes uh, around the world. Sure. Well, as you mentioned earlier, the Earth is a system of systems and the ice core record preserves um, the atmospheric chemistry c constituent from um, bubbles in the ice to atmospheric chemistries to, all, to uh, biological clues all the clues that the wind winds um, take to the Greenland, Antarctic, or other glacial sites. Um, we know from ice cores, um, for example, that um, um, in, that climate can change abruptly in less than 10 years from the Greenland ice core. We also know from ice cores that the CO2 record in the atmosphere now, we can go outside and measure it. Um, it's 417 parts per million. We know from ice cores, um, from direct measurements of over 800,000 years, that the, the CO2 varies naturally from 180 to 280 to 180 to 280, 180 to 280 parts per million over long-term glacial cycles. It's now 417 we are out of the realm of, of experience um, in terms of forcing our climate now. And the climate is changing rapidly because of that. And, and so Mary, you mentioned the history being in some part preserved, uh, not only in the ice core itself, but uh, in, in the winds that are sort of frozen in time in those ice cores. I'm assuming that's in sort of the bubbles that are in there and, and sort of the chemistry that you can define of the era from those bubbles, is that correct? Yes, as the snow falls on the ice sheets over years and years and centuries and decades to thousands of years, in the cold regions, it doesn't melt. As the snow compacts into fern and glacial ice, the bubbles that become trapped in that ice are samples of ancient atmospheres. So from ice cores, we can actually take those ice um, samples and through a complicated process, get the air out of the bubbles and measure the composition of the atmosphere over hundreds of thousands and uh, to millions of years. And so George, turning back to you, uh, as the climate cha has changed, I, I know you've uh, adjusted how you reach and how you live on Cooper Island when you're there. Can you maybe just briefly describe some of the day-to-day -day living arrangements that you've had to change on Cooper Island when you're, when you're there uh, doing your work? Yes, well, I mean, that's been an interesting part of the study is that I've had to adapt as much as the birds have had to adapt to a melting Arctic. Um, one of the most, uh, or one of the scariest things is that polar bears never visited the island for the first uh, 28 years of the study. And then uh, in the early 2000s, uh, I looked up and there was a polar bear uh, back at my camp walking through the tent where I kept my shotgun. And now polar bears are there on a regular basis. So I had to get a cabin uh, because the bears wrecked our tents in 2002. Um, and now I live in an eight by 12 uh, box with an electric fence around it because of the fact that polar bears are there. And they're there because they are they are moving south. It's one of the few things that isn't moving poleward as much because of the climate change. They're actually moving south because they, they are losing the substrate that they walk on. Um, and then coming to Cooper Island and trying to find food. And there isn't much food. Uh, for them, and they started eating my Gillimot chicks uh, in the early 2000s, and I had to find nest cases that were polar bear proof. The other big change is that for oh, at least the first quarter century, I had only fresh water that I got from melting multi-year sea ice. There's no fresh water on the island, and I would find pieces of multi-year ice uh, on the north side, uh, put them in bags, melt, melt it down. Uh, after after multiple years of freezing, the salt is driven out. And that's what we got by with uh, in terms of drinking water. There is no more multi-year ice washing up on the island anymore. So now I am forced to uh, melt snow as soon as I get out there because there are some big drifts around the cabin and then hope that it rains in August. And it's raining more frequently in August as a result of climate change. And I catch that water. So, so I've had to switch water supplies for that. And the... And the frost cellar that I used to have on the island to keep my yogurt and cheese and other things in, I would dig a hole down into the permafrost. 
the the permafrost where that frost cellar was are, is is gone. And I went out uh, a few years ago to dig that hole and uh, dug down three feet and hit water. So I don't have any way of keeping things. And now I have a refrigerator on the island uh, that I that I power with solar uh, and wind power to keep things cool. Can you describe the weather while you're there a little bit more? You mentioned it's raining more frequently. In, tr in terms of the weather, I and mean, one of the major things about the island, and probably one of the reasons I get excited about going up there every year, is that the sun's above the horizon uh, up until the 2nd of August. Uh, and then it, it sets then, but it doesn't really get dark until later in the year, so that one is able to go outside and see the weather on a regular basis in a way that if you have uh, the typical daylight cycle, you don't. So, so that I've been uh, able to observe how things are changing. And yet there has been this major uh, change with, with atmospheric circulation that is changing the, uh, changing the ice characteristics there, where we get more uh, moist air coming up from the north and as a result, more, uh, more rain on the island. Uh, in the past, uh, Utkiavik was thought to have uh, four inches of rain per year. Uh, uh, that's been upgraded to probably six to seven, but now they're getting much more than that. And, and, and we actually had four inches in, uh, in one summer recently. It's, it's like definitely getting warmer and it's, get, it's definitely getting uh, wetter and it's basically becoming subarctic. Um, um, I mean, all those characteristics are things that you find typically in the Bering Sea and, uh, and south of the Arctic Circle. Uh, James, turning back to you, uh, I know in addition to looking at uh, the temperature of water. You've also looked at uh, what's in the water in terms of uh, man-made pollution that goes in there. Um, plastics in particular have been obviously increasing in prevalence uh, in our oceans. I wonder if you can just sort of pick that thought up and uh, what the implications for our climate are there. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, uh, and rather complex uh, interrelationship. We've been looking at the role of plastics in the ocean, uh, particularly macroplastics form rafts as a uh, unexpected transport vector for non-native species, uh, literally across entire ocean basins. Uh, that in turn is linked to the uh, increasingly vast amount of plastic that has entered the oceans, and that actually is linked in a way to climate change. Uh, with um, a number of models, under a number of models, uh, we expect more cyclonic systems to develop, uh, uh, hurricanes, uh, monsoons, cyclones, which, um, increasing in intensity and in frequency. That in turn sweep along coastlines where we have staged in large metropolitan areas a really truly am an amazing amount of plastic material that can get then washed, ejected into the, into the world's oceans. So um, we saw that with a tsunami uh, in 2011 in Japan, which ejected a vast amount of plastic into the North Pacific, transported nearly 400 living Japanese species to the uh, Pacific Northwest, to the U.S. coast, and to Hawaii. And we believe this will be a pattern in the future as more plastic enters the ocean and therefore adds as a new transport vector for species uh, probably all over the world. Hmm. Uh, George, I, I wanted to ask you to um, talk a little bit about how why the average person should should care about all of this. And I, and I know this is the question that, that all three of you probably wrestle with uh, often, and it's a question many scientists uh, wrestle with when they're doing their work, but why should someone here in Connecticut really care if there are you know fewer birds on a remote island in Alaska, or if there are more plastics in the water, or if there's ice melting in Greenland? I mean, academically, the reasons are compelling, but but I, I lay that question at your feet, George. No, and I, I, I very much uh, realize that like there are six people in the world who care about black guillemot populations and three of them, I doubt their data and the other two don't like me much. So, so I mean, it isn't like my data on black guillemots is going to really be something that's going to convince people. And when I give talks to Audubon groups and various people like that, that, that aren't seabird people, I have frequently ended the talk talking about range shifts, talking about the fact that that like I am seeing the Guillemots range move north and the Guillemots can't do that because there's no islands north of there. And I then show a map of where wheat uh, is, is currently grown, or at least recent, up until recently was grown in the US and where given some scenarios, and this was something I pulled off the web, where wheat could be grown in North America in 2050, giving given certain climate change scenarios. And I tell people, I say, like, if you go home and if people say, you know, how was the Black Guillemot talk? Tell them that it was a talk about wheat. I mean, tell, tell, them, tell them it's a, it's, a, it's a talk about how 
if we if we uh, don't do something about climate change, ranges of, of food that we've been depending on and that, that our whole civilization is based on will be shifting and that then there'll be trouble for us just the same way there is for this obscure Guillemot colony up in the Arctic. Mary, I understand you've researched how wildfires may exacerbate ice melts in places like Greenland where you've done a lot of your research. Can you talk a little bit more about that connection? Sure. Well, like we mentioned earlier, the Earth is a connected system of systems. And so we were in central Greenland when the large ice melt happened. Our analysis showed black carbon from fires, and we traced those back to fires um, in northern Canada. Uh, there were fires in northern Canada, and they're increasing in frequency because of climate change, because it's getting warmer, because of pests moving north, killing the trees, and then the fires come. So that soot blew over over Greenland. It fell as the snow, and in a warm cycle, um, it got warmer during um, in, in Greenland the summer of 2012. The, su the snow probably would not have melted as much had it not had that that um, layer of soot, too small to really for the human eye to see, but we can we can measure it. It was enough um, for the albedo effect, the albedo or the reflectivity of the snow to be changed in order to create that widespread melt. Mary, I understand you're going to be visiting uh, Greenland in the coming weeks, heading to a, a, a community that's really, really far north there. Um, where uh, fuel, fossil fuels are, are very expensive and you've been doing some work to help, um, help mitigate some of those uh, cost burdens there. Can you uh, talk a bit more about that? Yeah, the, the people of the Arctic have been experiencing climate change for a long time. And although in mid-latitude countries like the US, scientists and people who live close to the land have realized it, much of the population is not. In the high Arctic, the population has been suffering dramatically because of the loss of sea ice, the changing fisheries, the expense of living there. Um, the, the village I'm working with is the village of Kanak in northwest Greenland. People have lived there for over, up to a thousand years, um, and they've lived in balance with nature, with the, with the hunting and the fishing. Um, they live modern lifestyles, and the cost of fossil fuels is now too high for them to afford their lifestyles. They are worried about losing their culture. They asked me to come to work with them and, and explore renewable energy where the, the wind and the sun and the water provide the energy that they need to live in balance with the future. And um, through the National Science Foundation, I've been fortunate to have a grant um, to do this work and it's really exciting. No one there doubts climate change. Uh, Jim, I wonder if you have any trips planned uh, coming up in the next few months, and if so, what you're expecting to see when you're out in the field. Just in a, a post-pandemic world, we're not traveling too much, not not uh, not in the very near future, but certainly in 2022, we're going to be going back to a number of field sites that where the work was delayed in both 2020 and actually for part of 2021. So we're going back to um, uh, planned trips to uh, Chile uh, and to the Galapagos Islands to look at the continuing movements and range expansions of quite a number of species and uh, also back to the Pacific Northwest uh, in 2022 where we're seeing a, uh, a number of species moving north uh, uh, along the Pacific Coast. That's California creep in that case uh, where a lot of species are coming up unexpectedly in, uh, in the sense of trying to predict which species will be moving. That's one of the big challenges of looking at range expansions. Uh, we know species are moving. We, can, we know that's going to happen. It's, um, it's when, not if. Predicting which species are going to be moving, poleward in both hemispheres, and predicting what their impacts will be, that's really one of the big challenges of looking at, at the, the movement of species under climate change scenarios. But again, the movement of species is one of the great indicators of climate change. If I can say just a word about, about why people should care, uh, much of what we're doing is to uh, look at all the various indicators of climate change. Um, uh, whether they are chemical, uh, biological, physical. And it really, it goes to understanding and try to communicate with the public and the political world um, through the media uh, often um, what that means to the quality of human life, the quality of the environment, what, what things are going to look like in 10, 20, 50 years, whether it's human health, whether it's the economy. The, there's nothing that climate change does not touch. And yet, as what we said earlier, there's still a 
um, an embarrassingly large fraction of the public who um, seems not to have actually absorbed that message. I want to thank our guests today, George Devoki, Director for Cooper Island Arctic Research, Mary Albert, Professor of Engineering at Dartmouth and Executive Director of the U.S. Ice Drilling Program, and James Carlton, Professor of Marine Sciences Emeritus at Williams College. Thanks to you all so, so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've talked about Alaska and the Arctic, we visited with ocean experts, and now we turn to New England. The six-state region we call home is in the middle of a dramatic shift away from fossil fuels. But the lingering effects of years and years of pollution have left their mark. But before we get to that story, let's take a look at New England's past, a history preserved in the journals of one of the region's most iconic naturalists, Henry David Thoreau. Joining me now is Richard Premack, professor of biology at Boston University, Katie Dykes, commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and Mark Mitchell, a physician and associate professor at George Mason University. Richard, we'll start with you. A lot of us think about Thoreau as a philosopher, but he was also a scientist making detailed observations of plants and birds in the 1850s. So what do Thoreau's journals and notes tell us, and how is that helping us understand climate change in New England today? During the 1850s, Thoreau made very detailed observations about when plants were flowering, when trees were leafing out, and when birds were migrating. And so what our research group has been doing is repeating these same observations and also working with residents of Concord who've been observing bird migration times. And we found that there have been very dramatic changes in Concord which are very clearly associated with climate change. So with the warming climate, the trees are leafing out about 14 days earlier, the wildflowers are leafing out about 10 days earlier, and the birds really aren't changing at all. So this actually represents one of the best examples of climate change that we have from anywhere in the world, and it's right here in Concord, Massachusetts. Can you talk about some other sources of data that you're drawing upon when you are looking at climate change in New England? Uh, I understand there's detailed weather records here and, and there's other sources, particularly around where you are in Concord, uh, that have been kept up since Thoreau did his work. That's right. So when we first started this work 20 years ago, there were no good examples of the effects of climate change from anywhere um, in the eastern United States. And we found that there's a great wealth of information here in New England because of all the universities, the culture of naturalists, and also the, the universities and museums in this region. And so there are records from really all over New England region. And we really focused on eastern Massachusetts. And for example, there's the Manomet Bird Observatory where they've been observing uh, bird migration times for 40 years. We have all the, those data, records of when birds are migrating at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Uh, there are all the records of flowering time kept at the Arnold Arboretum and many journals kept by individual naturalists. And all these records tell us the same thing, which is that the, the, the plants of this region are responding very strongly to climate change, uh, but that the birds are much less of a strong uh, single of climate change. And that's because when the birds are migrating up from the Caribbean and South America, they don't know that the climate has changed here yet. And so what you're describing there, Richard, is in some ways sort of an ecological mismatch where uh, plants are, are maybe flowering earlier, as you were saying, trees are, trees are leafing out earlier, uh, but the bird patterns haven't changed. So what, what are some of the implications that, that could stem from that? Right. So this is one of the most active areas of ecological research right now in the world, which is looking to see how there might be mismatches between different species or between different groups of species because of different responsivenesses to climate change. And one is the example of birds and plants. And when the birds arrive in the spring, they're eating insects. And if they're arriving a little bit late, they might miss this big pulse of insects, which is emerging early in the spring and feeding on the plants. And so this is something which is being very actively researched on and actually at the University of Connecticut is one of the leading uh, universities to be researching this topic. And people are looking to see how it's possible that bird populations might be declining because they, the birds don't have enough insects to eat when they arrive in the spring and they don't have enough insects to feed their nestlings when they start to develop early in the spring also. Uh, our research group in particular is also looking at the mismatch between trees and wildflowers, because it seems that trees are more responsive to climate change than wildflowers. And so it might be the trees le are leafing out ever earlier 
and will be shading out the early spring wildflowers. What's it like reading Thoreau's journals? Is it, is it difficult? Is it hard to understand? Uh, how are his observations? Well, Thoreau is, is really great. So people just love reading Thoreau. That's why the book Walden continues to be read even after uh, more than 160 years. There's always something new to read in them. And I read Walden as a book about climate change. So when I read Walden, he's telling us to observe nature carefully and we will see the effects of climate change. Um, he's telling us to live simply. Uh, in his case, he was telling us to live simply because then we would be healthier and happier. But also, as a civilization, that's really the way to deal with the problem of climate change. If we live simply and we use less fossil fuels, that's the way of dealing with climate change. And he's also telling us to stand up against injustice throughout the book Walden. In his time, he was telling us we should stand up against society for things like war and slavery. And now these things still exist in our society, uh, but we also have this problem of climate change. So if he was alive today, he would tell us that we should be, in addition to all the other injustices, we should also be fighting against climate change. So let's fast forward today and uh, Commissioner Dykes, I'll, I'll turn to you. What are some of the ways that we're seeing climate change play out in Connecticut right now? Well, I'll tell you, Patrick, that we have, uh, you know, we expect that we're going to see a lot of changes uh, happening over the next couple of years. We are a coastal state, uh, so 20 inches of sea level rise is projected by 2050, and we expect our coastal flood risk could increase by a factor of 5 to 10 with no change in storm conditions. Um, high water levels, uh, like what occurred during Superstorm Sandy here in Connecticut, uh, would be expected about every 5 to 10 years. Um, and, you know, another uh, important change is by mid-century, the number of days per year with temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit is expected to uh, increase from an average of five before the year 2000 to an average of 25 days per year. But those are all things in the future. And, you know, I think, Patrick, one of the really important things that I often, or misperceptions um, that, I, that I often encounter when uh, talking with folks about climate change is, so I think people think that we can wait until it gets bad enough, until it's really not tolerable anymore, and then uh, take action. <laughs> and that's just unfortunately not how it works. Um, all of those emissions that are in the air, you know, that are going into the air today are gonna be with us for a long time, and they're creating these accelerating and irreversible changes. And that's why it's so urgent um, for us to reduce fossil fuel use today as quickly as possible. And now, while well, climate change obviously is affecting uh, the Earth's environment, as the commissioner was outlining there, it's also affecting human health uh, and having real impacts there. Uh, Mark Mitchell, I'll turn to you. Uh, what are some of the health effects of climate change that you're seeing? Right. So uh, health professionals are seeing a, a number of different um, changes from the effects of climate change. I, I use a mnemonic that I call heat wave, where the H stands for direct heat-related effects uh, such as heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Uh, the E is for exacerbation of, of pre-existing uh, respiratory disease and, and cardiac disease. Uh, the A is for asthma. We're seeing hu uh, huge rates of asthma in Connecticut and in New England. Uh, T is for traumatic injury um, from severe weather uh, during uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, other severe weather. The W stands for water and foodborne illnesses uh, from things like blue-green algae, uh, red tide. Um, the A is for allergies. And again, in New England, we have some of the highest um, rates of allergies. Um, the uh, V is for vector-borne diseases uh, such as Lyme and West Nile uh, disease uh, and Zika. And then the E is for emotional and mental health um, uh, conditions uh, that, that we're seeing. That's a brief overview of the main uh, health effects that we're seeing. And I can, of course, go into detail about each one. Uh, Commissioner Dykes, I'll, I'll turn back to you. The region of New England right now is in the middle of a big shift away from fossil fuels uh, to newer sources like solar and wind. I wonder if you can talk a bit about how the state needs to retool its energy mix to avoid some of the harsher impacts of climate change. Sure. Connecticut, for example, is on track to have 91% of our power supply coming from emission-free resources by 2025. That's the good news. 
Um, but we still have a hill to climb when it comes to these other sectors and especially transportation. Our transportation sector is responsible for 40%, the largest share of emissions in our economy. And those emissions are growing um, because even though cars are more efficient, getting more miles per gallon, we're driving more. Uh, but there's bright spots here with a, a lot of auto manufacturers committing to shift to electric vehicles. Mark, uh, throughout your career, you've been uh, an outspoken witness to how city residents are, are bearing the cost of many of uh, our planet's environmental woes. Uh, and in the 1990s, you started the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice to educate the community about the link between pollution and, and communities of color. Can you uh, describe that link a, a bit more and, and what created it? You know, pregnant women are more likely to have um, babies prematurely uh, during the, the heat waves uh, if they're working outside, if, they're, uh, if they don't have access uh, to um, air conditioning. Um, we also see that asthma, uh, asthma in New England is very, very high compared to other parts of the country. Um, and um, we are seeing uh, more asthma due to the air pollution, uh, as the commissioner said, you know, the traffic related air pollution uh, is concentrated in um, uh, urban areas. And then we have the urban heat islands, uh, that is where there is less tree shading uh, in areas that uh, primarily the, uh, the areas that were formerly redlined, uh, where um, African-American communities were not allowed to get uh, loans to improve their neighborhoods. So when the temperature, the nighttime temperatures don't get below 70 degrees uh, for three days or more, then the um, number of people dying increases greatly. And again, it tends to be urban shut-ins, elderly residents in urban heat island areas uh, that, that suffer uh, from that. Richard, I, I wonder if you can pick up that idea of heat islands. I know this is something that you've looked at in Boston in particular, where you're seeing uh, you know, the effects of global warming contributing to temperatures rising there. But also on top of that, you're seeing the impacts of uh, the heat island effect uh, in, in Boston. So can you sort of pick that, pick that thought up and describe what you're seeing there? Well, certainly in, in the city, it's warmer than, than in more rural areas. And you see plants flowering earlier. So we look at the changes over time in terms of temperature, but also you can get a gradient just as you drive from Boston out into the suburbs. But I also just want to say that in, my, in, in the case of our own family, we can see the effects of climate change. When I was growing up, I live in the same house that I grew up in, which you can see behind me. And when I was growing up, my parents always said, you don't need air conditioning in Boston because it's, it never gets that hot. But now we've moved to having air conditioning in our house. Uh, when I go for a walk in the woods, I used to think that there was nothing that could harm us in the woods of New England. But now when I go out in the woods, I'm very, very careful about not getting ticks because ticks carry Lyme disease. And that's again, the kind of an effect of climate change that the ticks can survive over the winter now more easily. And then my wife is a very enthusiastic gardener. And when I was growing up, people always said that you can't grow figs in New England, that it's just too cold in the winter time. And now we grow figs very readily outside with minimal protection and we get good crops of figs um, here in the Boston area. So these are all, all signs of climate change. Are the rapidly rising temperatures that we're seeing in city areas serving as some sort of predictor for temperature rise that we're going to see writ large in other parts of the world or the country? There's a lot of variation in temperature and- I'm asking you uh, to predict the future there, so I understand that's difficult. <laughs> so cities represent kind of a model. So, um, and I think that, that probably Mark would agree with that, that the that cities are, are hotter than, than the rural areas right now, but they're just an indication of what's going to happen in suburbs and in, in rural areas around New England. It's just happening earlier in the cities because the cities are several degrees warmer than the surrounding areas because of all the buildings and, and asphalt and also the concentrations of carbon dioxide um, in the air above cities in still conditions. And so these all contribute, but they're just kind of a, a predictor of what will be happening through the rest throughout the rest of New England in coming decades. Uh, Commissioner Dykes, turning back to you, I, I wanted to ask you quickly about the Transportation and Climate Initiative. This was a proposed uh, multi-state agreement to cap emissions from 
large-scale fossil fuel producers and reinvest a portion of that money into uh, some communities that have been overburdened by air pollution. It's had a, a tough road uh, here in Connecticut. It's had a tough road in other uh, New England and mid-Atlantic states. Uh, why do you think there's been sort of the, the pushback to tr the Transportation Climate Initiative? Well, I'll say, you know, we remain committed to the Transportation Climate Initiative here in Connecticut. Um, we know that we will not be able to meet the legislatively mandated uh, targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions 45 percent by 2030 unless we have um, a tool that's as impactful as the Transportation Climate Initiative, or TCI, um, to help us significantly reduce emissions. And the terrific things about TCI is that it leverages regional action. Uh, we have been working with Rhode Island, with Massachusetts, with uh, DC um, on seeking to implement this program. Um, it does, in Connecticut, require legislative authorization, and so that's the step we've been focused on. Uh, but the policy is so sound, the program is so impactful uh, that we are just continuing to, uh, to work hard um, to get adoption of this tool, which we desperately need. And yet adoption still has been been difficult, as I don't have to tell you. I mean, why do you think it has been difficult to get this through the legislative hurdles that it needs to pass? Look, uh, climate action is something that uh, is still hard uh, to do. You know, we have to get people focused on um, addressing climate change. Uh, sometimes people think of this as like a far off issue that we'll deal with uh, tomorrow. Um, but I think as we stand here in 2021, you've just heard um, about all of those different observable, tangible changes that we're seeing in our environment. Um, it's becoming clearer and clearer that we can't delay and we can't give up. And, um, and it is so urgent uh, to make these changes um, and implement these programs as quickly as we can. And, you know, the changes that we're seeing are not just in the natural world from climate change. I spoke with a mayor today um, whose uh, rating agencies is, is asking them and they're, when they're doing uh, municipal bond ratings about what investments uh, the, the municipality is making um, in addressing climate change. You know, I hear from businesses on the flip side that are investing in building out electric vehicle charging uh, infrastructure. We have an electric vehicle charging manufacturer right here in Connecticut employing 150 people. They're looking to expand uh, because they see this enormous, incredible, exciting uh, transformation and, and clean transportation revolution that's coming. So these are some examples, sort of like the the trees and the and 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 the birds and the insects. Um, so too is our economy changing, and um, and so it's really critical that uh, we work with policymakers um, to stay in in line with, frankly, the private sector, which is making these changes really dramatically now. Mark, I want to turn back to you. Uh, maybe speak about how you think we can motivate people to care about the issue of climate change. What what gets people fired up? What gets people uh, passionate about this issue? Right. So um, our research at George Mason shows that uh, people really are concerned about the health effects um, of climate. Uh, they are concerned about their children having asthma and knowing that uh, if we address uh, climate change, we can reduce the amount of asthma. And that's why it's so important that we invest and that we do uh, it in a way uh, to benefit those who are most vulnerable. You know, we need to uh, develop uh, plans for resilience um, and they need to be hyper local. We need to identify those who are most vulnerable and most likely to die uh, during a climate disaster and to plan uh, to, uh, to make sure that they don't die, uh, to make sure that they can um, survive the, the changing climate. Richard, when, when you compare what Thoreau saw in the 1850s to what biologists are seeing out in the field today, how, how does that make you feel? Well, one thing is it certainly convinces me that climate change is a reality. So any naturalist that is looking at long-term records or making observations over years sees the effects of climate change. If you, if you just start noting, keeping a journal about the effects of climate change, then you can see the effects. As a scientist, it's, it's a very interesting time to live because it's a time in which we see the world changing in front of us. Decades ago, when scientists looked at natural systems, they often thought of them as being in equilibrium, as forces balancing out. But now, as biologists, we're seeing things changing in front of us. Whether you're a marine biologist or an ornithologist, whether you're looking at forests or insect communities, 
you just see things are changing so rapidly in front of us. So it's a time which is exciting, but is also frightening. I want to thank all our guests today, Richard Premack, a professor of biology at Boston University, Katie Dykes, commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and Mark Mitchell, a physician and associate professor at George Mason University. Thanks so much to all of you for coming on today and sharing your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In his book, Carrying the Fire, Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins describes going to space and looking back home. He says, if I could use only one word to describe the Earth as seen from the moon, I would ignore both its size and color and search for a more elemental quality. That of fragility. The Earth appears fragile above all else. I don't know why, but it does. From the sea to the sky, our planet is in our care. This is Cutline. Thanks for joining us. I'm Patrick Scahill. Funding provided by Connecticut Green Bank.